Howdy y'all, welcome back. Today, we will be taking a brief but detailed dive into the history of Old World Portland, Oregon. Old World being, in this sense, the oldest known photographs of Portland before the year 1940. We're told in the overarching narrative that Portland was essentially a rather large city, yet it faced a series of hardships that were often followed by pockets of steady growth, almost as if the history occurred in cycles or it was compartmentalized. The last major event in this cycle would be the renovation, some would call it the destruction or demolition of Old World Portland that occurred during the 1930s and early 1940s. This demolition event, said to be caused by the need to replace the hundreds of cast iron buildings in Portland, has fueled much debate among scholars and historians alike. For much of the early history of Portland, really we are led to believe that in 50 years or less, from roughly the 1880s through 1930, Portland arose out of relative nothingness to become a sprawling iron city of immense and irrefutably important architecture. And yet, that brings us to what could be considered the meat and potatoes of this video. That would be that in the earliest images of Portland, let's say from the 1860s through the 1880s, we see an abundance of open land throughout a handful of photographs, all being labeled as the city of Portland. That would be fine, really. It would be an excellent way to grasp the magnitude of the massive construction projects which would follow and shape the landscape. That is, if we had any proof that the massive scale construction projects took place in the years that followed. Sure, we have before and then we have after photographs. We have an elaborately condensed history, which has been supplied to us by the powers that be. And yet, as we look at the official history of Portland, for a short time in the early 1900s, a time when Portland should have been bustling with new life, construction, and business, we have seldom a photograph depicting Portland at all. In the images that we do have that I was able to find, most of the time, we see that the photographs have been taken well after the completion of whatever structure, building, location that we're looking at. Whether it's a government building, a home, a bridge, a factory, even the streets, which suddenly are littered with telegraph and telephone poles. They're paved. We really don't have any photographs of note being taken during the construction of the original Old World City of Portland. As we look through the selected photographs from the turn of the century, from the early 1900s, the ones that I could actually get my hands on, seeing as many of these were hard to find, they weren't on the Historical Society website or on the Wikipedia page, I had to dig to find these. Now, as we look through them, we find photographs of really immense architecture, amazing antiquitech, and other anomalies around the city. But the question becomes, where were the photographers to photograph this construction? We can look all around. We do not have any construction photographs, but we do know photographic companies were present in Portland. One of these photographers who sticks out to me and whose work we'll be diving into today was named Minor White. He undertook the task of photographing what he called the old city of Portland before it was completely demolished in what White revealed to be an absolutely breathtaking moment. Not only do we see architecture on par with the other major cities of the world, the same oversized lost architecture with endlessly tall ceilings, 20 foot tall front doors, but within White's photographs, we can clearly see that much of Portland appears to have been abandoned by the late 1930s. Again, these photographs made me question what exactly I was looking at as soon as I saw them. We literally see buildings that could hold hundreds if not thousands of people and this is at a time when we have cars. We have, really, what should be 300, 400, 500,000 people in the city of Portland. And yet, we see empty streets with no cars, with no people, with nothing. And then as we look closer at the buildings, we can see that many of them don't have windows. We can see inside. There's nothing inside these buildings. It's as if they've been gutted. Even before I had a chance to dive into the official narrative, 
I could see clear as day that we have at least some evidence in Portland that there was a reset. What made this topic even more ripe for the picking were the resources that were made available to me in discovering the images that we'll be looking at today. In most cases of my research in other old world cities and other topics, I'm led or drawn to certain areas simply by coincidence. Doing research into one topic, rabbit holes into a handful of newer topics worthy of discussion. In this case, I found myself researching the West Coast, more specifically the wireless lights that you can find on the West Coast. I kept finding articles pointing me to Portland and its city of lights, but alas, when I tried prying into the Historical Society of Portland, as well as various libraries associated with Old World Oregon, I came to find that many of the results had been scrubbed or put behind a paywall. To elaborate, I can usually wrap up my research on a topic by achieving a level of understanding using the oldest photographs. Words as miraculous as a device as they are, are still a device which leaves much to our imagination. Photographs, on the other hand, are one of the most visceral ways we have to experience the old world. My videos wouldn't be nearly as important as they are if they didn't contain the rarest and oldest photographs of these specified areas. Now, this is important basically within the history of Portland because no matter what official organization you attempt to go through, it appears that most of the interesting and important images of old world Portland have been purposefully erased, hidden in archives that have not been made available to the public, or simply thrown behind a paywall, even though the images should be in public domain. Immediately, this should make you question it like I did, question the narrative and the reasoning behind this. Wikipedia in this search was no help either. What's usually a vast assortment of historical images was instead, in the case of Portland, a deeply curated, to the point of being hollow, collection of maybe 20 images of Portland before the year 1930, and with little information about each. For me, this simply would not cut it, and I could not rest until I found some more accurate and revealing images of Old World Portland. To my luck, and some would say to my chagrin, the most lucrative source for these images became a website about Portland's history, which was published well over a decade ago and seems to have not been updated in several years. The website is rudimentary, seemingly using scripts from 10 years ago or more, but the photographs are hard-coded into the website, and many of the images were small in size, so I apologize for that. But I couldn't help going through these images with you and feeling like this was the best real history of Portland that I could share. These photographs, which clearly have labels indicating they came from the historical society or other reputable libraries and collections, these photographs were the same images that appear to have been scrubbed from the official Portland website and the official narrative, as if the author of this original website was able to pull these images decades ago, whenever they were first digitized, essentially saving a part of history. Otherwise, we might not have been able to see these photographs today. In today's video, we're going to go over these oldest photographs of Portland, Oregon, and I'm going to be diving into the many articles published on this website, as well as diving into the currently accepted narrative as told to us by the mainstream. I'm going to keep this section of the video as brief as possible, as for in many of my old world videos, the photographs here really do speak for themselves. I apologize for the quality of some of these photographs, as again, they had to be saved by screenshot and many of these photographs were unable to be copied or pasted or enlarged because the originals of these photographs don't appear anywhere else besides this website. Essentially, we found a dead website, maybe decades old and not updated for nearly as long, but a website that was dedicated to documenting and cataloging the true history of Portland, Oregon. The same history, it appears, that was being strategically compartmentalized. Today, we'll look through all these photographs that I found, the oldest known photographs of Portland before its great renovation. We'll see a city of tradition, of culture, and immaculately quick growth. A city whose buildings seemed tall enough for the angels and whose lights danced from the 1900s onward, creating a riveting white city, iron city, shrouded in this layer of light. The construction photographs, they're nowhere to be seen. Yet in 50 years, the city of Portland, Oregon arose in the 1880s from a cast of small farms and shoddy establishments to a sprawling city during the turn of the century to finally a seemingly empty city in need of a historical and architectural facelift by World War II. So let's see what the current narrative has to say about all of this. 
Right off the bat, the history here appears really ample for our deciphering. We're told that no official occupation occurred in Portland until at least the 1800s, or at least none that was documented. The land that makes up Portland was first known as the Clearing. The Clearing was a location roughly halfway between Oregon City and Fort Vancouver, and received its name for being one of, if not the only spot along the river between those two points that had been cleared by indigenous people for resting. The first official settlement, so to speak, being when William Overton and Asa Lovejoy filed to claim the land west of the Willamette River in the year 1843. Before that time, Portland and most of Oregon was, centuries over, occupied by the upper Chinook tribes of the Multnomah and Cascade people. We're told by the mid-1800s, however, this indigenous population had nearly entirely fled the area, having been decimated by European spread diseases like smallpox. Thus, the clearing was cleared for occupation. John Couch was the first man to trace the land and advertise it as hospitable. This was followed by Overton and Lovejoy, who purchased the 640 acres of the clearing in 1843. Interesting as it is, both Overton and Lovejoy were somehow squeezed out of the project by 1846. We're told Overton grew bored of all the trees and sold his half of Portland to Francis Pettigrove in 1845. That same year, Lovejoy and Pettigrove decided the name of Portland with a coin flip which Pettigrove, who had only been part of the project for a couple of months, won. After losing the naming of the city on a coin flip, Lovejoy, the other quote, original founder, sells his half of Portland to one Benjamin Stark. Convoluted already? It gets worse. Only three years after buying Portland, Pettigrove also becomes bored of the trees and enamored by the thought of gold and sells the entirety of Portland, including Ben Stark's shares, to Daniel Lonsdale, a tanner. According to these reports, Lonsdale bought Portland with his leather, over $5,000 worth. The same leather, suspected to have been sold by Pettigrove in San Francisco some years later, which turned around to make Pettigrove a fortune. Lonsdale, now believing himself to be the sole owner of Portland, then goes on to sell half of this land to Stephen Coffin in 1849. However, also in 1849, Benjamin Stark returns to Portland with John Couch, the first man to document that area, and Stark demands his share of the land, which had already been sold to Lonsdale by Pettigrove. Also in 1849, somehow a third man, William Chapman, buys one third of all of Portland for $26,666. By 1850, Lonsdale is forced to leave Portland to head to San Francisco over his legal battle with Stark, all in regards to the Portland land. Stark and Lonsdale end up agreeing to divide the land amongst themselves. However, they seemingly forget about Chapman and Coffin, who also now technically own Portland. When Lonsdale returns to Portland, he is forced to again negotiate, this time with Chapman and Coffin, until all four men, Lonsdale, Stark, Chapman, and Kaufman own pieces of the land that is today Portland. From this point forward, Portland begins to steadily grow, and these four men are often considered to be the founding fathers of this landscape, at least for the colonists. Now, Portland began in the shadow of Oregon City, roughly 12 miles away. However, Portland's existence at the conflux of the Willamette and Columbia River gave it a clear advantage over those neighboring towns. By 1850, the first census taken in Portland, the population was over 820 people, including a handful of freed men. However, Portland also had a major issue in these earliest descriptions. It was a city of mud, even being known by many as Mud Town, all the while being the largest city in the Pacific Northwest. And I quote, it was a place where stumps from fallen firs laid scattered dangerously about front and first streets. Humans and animals, carts and wagons, slogged through a sludge of mud and water. Sidewalks often disappeared during the spring flood." End quote. By 1873, this largest city in the Northwest was destroyed by a great fire, which occurred in August of that year. 
This fire laid waste to over 20 city blocks, causing $1.3 million in damages and destroying the heart of Portland. By 1889, the city had still not yet been fully rebuilt and was considered by many, including the newspaper The Oregonian, to be the filthiest city in all of the Northwest. We're told, while the city of Portland begins to show signs of massive architecture, elaborately designed buildings which seem to exceed the common knowledge at the time, and these structures that are so large that they dwarf the population, we're told even by the turn of the century into the early 1900s, the sewer system in place barely worked. The streets flooded with mud any time it rained, and the sidewalks kept disappearing back into the earth. The city was called a disgrace by the West Shore newspaper. However, we're told things began to advance with the first bridge across the Willamette River into Portland, which was completed in 1887, known as the Morrison Street Bridge. It took until the late 1890s for the railroad to reach Portland. Up until this time, the main aspects of Portland were always sourced nearby. So again, as we look through all of these photographs and images today, the latest being taken right before World War II, we see this huge, sprawling, empty, yet visually completed city known as Portland. We're told in roughly 1900, the streets still remained mostly mud-covered. There were no paved sidewalks, and the attempt to do so always failed. We're told in 1900, the railroad had also just reached Portland, and for years before that, Portland was built mainly using nearby sources. So how is it then that we can justify the photographs we see today of Portland? Is it possible for a city to go from next to nothingness or being a slew of large but secluded cabin-like structures in the woods surrounded by mud to a massive, sprawling, concrete, stone, and iron completed city replete with huge buildings, 20-foot doorways, lights, paved streets, electricity, telegraph and telephone lines to a city that is apparently dead by the 1940s. Fully built out, yet seemingly abandoned. Can one city go through all those stages in 50 years? Now, as we go through the remainder of these photographs of Portland, the one thing to keep in mind is just how old some of these photographs are compared to the newer photographs we'll be looking at. You can see such a difference in the city from the earliest images that we looked at in the video. When Portland was just a sprawling farming landscape or the clearing where all the trees had been cleared, it's a very ironic name that we have. And we wonder what the indigenous people really built here. If there really was an infrastructure that they laid that was covered up and eventually it was dug out or it was repurposed, it was used to build the city that Portland became because eventually within just a small number of years, 20 to 30 years, we go from this open landscape, all this open land and farmland to a city that is bustling with life. Not only do they pave the streets, they put up street lights, they electrify everything, but we have this old world architecture that becomes abundant everywhere you look. And just years before that, really a decade or two before that, there was nothing in this landscape. So to imagine all of this arrived at Portland in this small amount of time is very interesting, especially when we have the fact given here that Portland did not receive railroad travel until the late 1890s. So before that, essentially everything was being harvested. It was being manufactured within the area of Portland or somewhere close nearby. Again, we have to question who was behind all of this that was being built and if all of this being built really had an ulterior motive, if it had an ulterior purpose, if it was in fact here earlier serving a different purpose for a different community. Now, as we get into this further, something that often arises in these cities that have this sort of dichotomy that's created a sort of hidden history, we also have this Rose City Festival being held at the Rose City. Portland became known as the Rose City. Now, we can already see ties there to Britain, to Great Britain, the War of the Roses, the elite of Europe, things like that. But when we look at the Rose City Festival that occurred in Portland, we can clearly see that there were pockets of this elite status. There were pockets of these secret societies, of these rich people who look to identify with the ancient past. And it makes us wonder if there's more to this story than really meets the eye. And that brings us to the last part of the video. When we're looking at the early photographs from the 1900s, one thing that stands out is how these photographs are not available on the Portland Historical Society. They are not available on the Portland Wikipedia page. They are not available on any official source. I had to look at a web page that was published over a decade ago that is dedicated to Portland's history, but that's the only place that these photographs became available. 
by 1905 to adhere to the new growth which seemed to be shaping the city. The Lewis and Clark Centennial World's Fair was held in Portland, accompanied by a slew of brand new old world style architecture. This charade pushed Portland into the limelight, causing the population to more than double in just five years to over 200,000 people in 1910. In 1912, the 52 Benson Bubblers, a set of 52 street fountains, were installed around the city. And then on June 9, 1934, the International Longshoremen's Association of Portland participated in the West Coast Waterfront Strike, effectively shutting down shipping across the entire West Coast of America. This reverberated around the world, leading to violence, but also to massive advancements in the treatment of plant and factory workers in America. This is where we get to the real question of this video. Can the next part that I'm about to get into be fully believed? We're told by World War II or the year 1940, Portland was one of the fastest growing cities in the nation, on the cusp of its economic and population boom, fueled by Congress providing funds to Portland to produce materials for Great Britain's upcoming war effort. It appears many of the photographs and most of the history that is talked about nowadays is the history after the Great Renovation, after the Great Demolition that occurred in the late 1930s and the early 1940s as photographed by Minor White. So as we look at these photographs from Minor White, we'll find a city that is empty. It looks nothing like it did 20 years earlier. What happened before this demolition? And I know, I know. Some of you will make the argument that the photographs taken in the late 1930s and the early 1940s, especially the ones taken by Minor White, show the city after the people were removed, and they were only removed for this demolition process. It was all something that was done by the city, it was done purposefully, and that's why you don't see any cars or any people. Yet, we don't see any construction workers, we don't see any machinery to do the demolition. We don't see anything when we consider the details at hand. If this city really was abandoned just for this demolition process, where did all of the people go? Why would the people have been taken out of the city before the machinery was even brought into place? How long were these buildings abandoned or was the population forced to be out of their homes, out of their businesses, out of their factories? How long did this occur before the actual demolition and rebuild took place? Because one can imagine this would take at least a year, if not more. And yet, we have these examples of photographs over a three-year period that show throughout this whole three-year period, not one single person or not a large group of people in any of these photographs. We might see one car or one person here or there. And this is the 1930s. Photography was so highly detailed at this time. There's no type of photograph that wouldn't capture people if they were there. So we can basically see that this area of Portland was abandoned. If that's not the definition of type of history that we must question, I don't know what is. Yet, as we look at the photographs of Portland, more specifically at the photographs by Minor White taken in downtown Portland from these exact specified dates, what we see is not a city that's booming, but a city in recession. What we should be seeing, according to the mainstream narrative, is upwards of 1 million people. But instead, we see empty streets, these dilapidated buildings that are missing entire floors, factories that are no longer in operation, clearly, and many of the streets appear to be missing the furnishings like the lights that they had earlier. It's as if these photographs were taken at an entirely different time than Portland in the late 1930s and 40s. It's as if they were taken earlier. Again, the mainstream says this was one of the most prosperous times for Portland, including downtown Portland, when the city was at its peak. And yet the official photographs by Minor White in the late 1930s and early 1940s seem to indicate the opposite. The dichotomy created between what we see and what we're told is so vast it's really hard for me to explain the rest of the narrative. In the 1940s, Portland experienced a great flood known as the Vanport or Columbia River Flood, which ended up damaging any remaining iron buildings that stood in Portland or any of these old world buildings. They were damaged by this flood. Also, in the 1940s, it's written that Portland came under the control of organized crime. Up until the 1970s, the transportation of Portland and many other aspects of the city were privately owned. When these all 
ended up going public, new government agencies were formed, leading to easier and increased travel into the city of Portland, and then another population boom occurred. So this narrative says, really, there's pockets of population growth. By 1990, Portland received the dot-com bump, essentially a huge boost in younger populations, mainly in their 20s and early 30s, moving to and arriving to Portland to conduct their business. From there, we are all mostly familiar with the history of Portland in the last 20 years or so. If not, go turn on the radio or your TV or just Google Portland and you'll see what's going on there nowadays. Not exactly the same place that it was 150 years ago.